With the Canadian declaration of war on 10 September 1939, thousands of young men came forward to enlist in the Royal Canadian Air Force to fight against Nazi Germany. A significant number of Canadian women sought to join the RCAF with the outbreak of hostilities but were, in most cases, politely told that war was no place for a woman. The government had been reluctant to authorize the enlistment of women in military services. But by the summer of 1941, however, it became apparent that the military was facing a significant manpower shortage. For this reason, given the uncertain situation overseas, consideration was given to the possibility of women entering the service and replacing men in non-combat roles. After all, the British had been employing service women for the past two years with excellent results. The Royal Air Force's success in this program may have inadvertently added a political dimension to the question of enlisting women in the Royal Canadian Air Force. As the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan expanded, more and more British instructors and support personnel were arriving in Canada, some of whom were bound to be members of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. The possibility of explaining to hostile female voters why British women could serve and not Canadian women was not something that appealed to politicians. Therefore, on 2 July 1942, an order in council authorized the formation of the Canadian Women's Auxiliary Air Force, and the Royal Canadian Air Force became the first military service to actively recruit women. Within six months, the CWAAF changed its name to the Royal Canadian Air Force Women's Division. Its members would be subject to the same terms of service, discipline, and responsibilities as their male counterparts. At about the same time, the Government of Canada announced through the press the decision to form a Canadian Women's Army Corps. In view of the increasing demand upon Canada's available manpower for armed forces, industry, agriculture, and other essential services, Ottawa had decided to enroll several thousand women volunteers for service in Canada as full-time armed forces auxiliaries. The employment of women would permit the utilization of their services as cooks, clerks, stenographers, and telephone operators, and thus release men for work elsewhere. The first recruits reported to the divisional registrars on 01 September 1941. The first courses for officers and NCOs assembled on 23 February 1942 at Macdonald College in Montreal. In March 1942, the Army too took the step of promoting the Corps from auxiliary to full Army status. By July 1942, the Royal Canadian Navy was seeing the benefits of women in service within the Army and Air Force and elected to follow their lead. Initially, there was concern in several naval circles that all the best candidates would have already joined the Army and the Air Force when these services were recruiting back in 1941. However, in a radio interview in 1943, it was affirmed the Navy was, in fact, inundated with applications. Superintendent Joan Carpenter of the Women's Royal Naval Service in Britain, or Wrens as they were known, stated that she had been tremendously impressed by the enthusiasm of the Canadian girls everywhere she went. She mentioned that they all seemed anxious to serve and to do something constructive to help win the war. They were receptive as well to naval tradition and were amenable to discipline. It is not clear whether National Defense Headquarters contemplated overseas service for the Women's Army Corps at the time of its organization. It was, however, in February of 1942 that the possibility of overseas employment was first recorded as static-based laundry facilities were desperately needed in the United Kingdom. It was suggested to Canadian military headquarters by the War Office laundry experts that 150 other ranks might be efficiently replaced by women. Civilian labour was not available and the most suitable alternative appeared to be the employment of a Canadian Women's Army Corps detachment. The principal objection to bringing such personnel overseas had been based upon the argument that their employment would create a most difficult administrative problem. The static-based laundry, however, was another matter. A group of 150 Women's Army Corps personnel could be supervised as a unit by their own officers. Furthermore, as the laundry was still to be constructed, there would be ample time for the provision of suitable barracks. As headquarters was deeply concerned over the matter of manpower shortages and was therefore interested in any suggestion which promised to alleviate the situation, it was agreed that it would be uneconomical of manpower to, quote, tie up 150 men on the washing of clothes when women could do the job just as well. On 22 October 1942, the first draft of the Women's Army Corps to be detailed for overseas service left Canada, two months later than had originally been contemplated owing to unexpected delays in accommodation arrangements. Excited, happy, and delighted with the temporary mansion-like accommodations which had become their barracks, this group was given a most enthusiastic welcome. Particularly happy to meet them were Canadian soldiers who had not seen home or Canadian women, in uniform or otherwise, 
in two or three years. The one telephone in the building was greatly overworked as the women endeavored to establish communication with spouses, relatives, and friends. Curiosity in their arrival was shown by members of the press who were busy with cameras. Movies of the landing, of the house, and of the women were secured for future records. Papers even ran special articles. Considerable interest was shown in the Canadian Women's Army Corps and offers of hospitality poured into the barracks. Tours, tea dances, and theatre parties were arranged by the public relations officer in the YMCA. The first mail arrived in gratifying quantities on 02 December 1942 and by the middle of the month Christmas preparations and parties were an absorbing interest. In addition to the celebrations of the season, there was the added excitement of preparing for the rumoured second draft of arrivals. A very large majority of women in the Army Corps were employed in a clerical capacity. With a total other rank strength of over 850 by April 1944, 11 trades were represented including clerk, cook, switchboard operator, cipher operator, dental assistant, postal sorters, and driver mechanics. With regard to enlistment in general, the accounts of a number of former Canadian Wrens demonstrate the wide range of reasons why they chose to join the armed forces, having left in certain cases well-paying jobs in civilian life in order to do so. Most were motivated by a desire to do more and to contribute to the war effort. Some wanted to travel throughout Canada and overseas in order to see and learn more about the world. Additionally, some were bored with their current employment and were seeking something that would interest them to a greater extent and, not the least, to be part of an adventure with a far greater purpose. While pay eventually increased to within 80% of their male equivalents, initially women were paid much less. A common and misdirected rule of thumb was that it took three women to do the work of two men. It was argued, therefore, that they should only receive two-thirds of the salary. Over time, as the true value of their efforts were realized, that perception changed. Although women in the Canadian Navy face considerably less dangerous circumstances by virtue of not being permitted to serve at sea, they were by no means exempt from danger. When ships were sunk or torpedoed, Canadian wrens working in ports were affected and deeply saddened by the losses. Frequently, they had friends aboard these ships or had simply met the sailors in passing. In this manner, the wrens had a higher degree of exposure to the realities of war than many other women on the home front. Recruitment for women in the naval service continued throughout the war until February 1945, and by the end of April of that year, there had been approximately 6,500 Canadian wrens brought into the service, primarily from Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia. Total wartime enlistment for the Canadian Women's Army Corps comprised of over 22,000 members, and the Royal Canadian Air Force Women's Division eventually consisted of more than 17,000 servicewomen, thus making the Navy by far the smallest of the three services. Servicewomen were pioneers in gaining recognition of the ability and skills that they had to offer the nation as a whole. In an age when most women were expected to remain at home and wait quietly for their husbands, fathers, or brothers to return from the front, they volunteered to enter a strange new world. They joined for adventure, a steady job, ties to the service, or simple patriotism. In other words, for the same reasons men joined. While on the surface, the involvement of women in military service permitted the reassignment of men to active combat, the long-term impact runs much deeper. As manpower shortages were being experienced within two years of the declaration of war, Women volunteers effectively postponed the very volatile political option of conscription until late 1944. Over the course of the four years they served, they demonstrated the drive, will, intelligence, and moral character of their counterparts. If a war was to be won, it would be won with women and men standing side by side. A large reduction in personnel occurred when the war ended. By December of 1946, all three branches of the women's service had been disbanded. While their formal organization had been withdrawn, the spirit of their service persisted. Women were again allowed to enroll in the military in the early 1950s, though their engagements were restricted to more traditional roles. In 1985, after Parliament passed the Canadian Human Rights Act and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the Department of National Defence changed its policies to permit women to serve at sea, with Army service battalions, and in most air squadrons. Servicewomen of the Navy, Army, and Air Force endured much hardship while serving Canada. It was their determination, dedication, and professionalism that opened the door for so many women to join. Courageous women faced many obstacles as they entered what was traditionally a man's arena. 
Not only did they have to do the job and excel at it, but first they had to prove that given the opportunity, they would not fail. It was a daunting challenge that women met with hope, courage, and most importantly, success. Women now serve on global initiatives ranging from peacekeeping and humanitarian assistance to stability, security, and peace enforcement operations. This equality of service in the truest sense is the long-term impact of women joining the military in the uncertain days of 1941.